Here at BizVision and BBTV, we're passionately committed to the belief that today and tomorrow's leaders will live conscious leadership in all areas such as leading agile change compassionately, being authentically focused on planet and people, and understanding that social purpose is as equal as profit. Achieving that, we believe that he or she will lead the company with a long future. But to get there, resolute and resilient, it's not just a case of throwing some fairy dust over yourself, your people and your business. True and sustainable success results from sound and sensible strategic thinking. My guest today knows how to deliver exactly that. She's the author of many books, but it's her latest that we want to explore with her to set us on that true conscious leadership path. Please meet the author of The Regenerative Life. Welcome, Carol Sanford. Hello, Carol. Hello, Malcolm, and thank you so much for having me. It's a delight. Now, explain to um, uh, us uh, people here in the UK or in other parts of the world, where are you today? I am in a small town just north of Seattle, Washington, in the States. Ah, right. The left, the left bit of the USA as you're looking at. <laughs> yes, the yeah. left bit. <laughs> yeah. But uh, as a, I've met a lot of wealthy people from around there. Carol, I've been really looking forward to meeting you. Your, your thinking and writing so resonates with the times we're now in, especially around your theory of change. Now, Viewers and listeners, as I said in my opening piece, sustainable and beneficial change comes from the right strategic foundation. Mm -hmm. I'll be talking to Carol in three parts. In my first part, I want to explore with her what regenerative is all about in respect of today's leaders. In part two, I want to ask her about her theory of change and to take us in simple terms through its four elements. And in part three, I want to ask her to kindly give you a selection of action points that as today's leaders, you can apply from regenerative life. So as Carol says, to build a regenerative business that becomes enduringly non-displaceable in its market. So strap yourself in, everyone, for some inspirational learning. But first, Carol, can you briefly tell us who Carol Stanford is? I, I read that your father was Grand Dragon of the Texas Ku Klux Klan. Frightening start for you in life. And well, why do you have this passion for the regenerative agenda? Over to you, Carol. Well, the good news is that I also had an amazing grandfather uh, who was part Mohawk, came up through an indigenous worldview. And that's a lot of who I am today, was that combination a father who was broken and could not see that all humans and all of life could be nurtured and we could be a steward of it. But my grandfather could, and it made a stark reality. To, and of course, it was not his father. It was my mother's father. That's led me today to doing things like uh, serving as a senior fellow of social innovation for Babson College, which... Um, is the number one and number two uh, school in entrepreneurship, uh, according to U.S. News and World Report. As you pointed out, I'm an author of quite a few books, and I have a brand new one, which will be out in October. I run and produce and am the on-air talent for three podcasts, all that are about the kind of subject you're talking about. And I run a series of communities for people who want to study and learn this way of thinking in community rather than one person at a time. Maybe that's enough. Yeah, I think so. You're a busy lady. I'm so lucky, so lucky to find time with you. Carol, let's move into part one of our chat. Right. Can you tell us what the regenerative life is all about in respect of today's leaders and also how your book will help such leaders build that enduring, non-displaceable business? What value will it deliver for them? Well, for me, value only comes about when we have systemic return. So let me talk about what regeneration means to speak to that. In other words, if you work with only close-in value, it all comes back to you, which we'll get to when we talk about a theory of change. It's pretty limited. 
I say there are six words if you want essential. I don't believe in the idea of simple. I think simple usually means dumb it down, chop off uh, all of what the meaning really is. Uh, and so let's take those six words. Uh, they'll give us a basis for the other thing you proposed also. So the six words are evolve capacity for essence expression through system actualization. Now, those are dense, right? Let me unpack mm. them a little bit. Yeah. The biggest thing that you'll see when we talk about my theory of change is it's not about behaviorally modifying other people, convincing them, getting uh, communications right. It's about evolving capacity of each person to be what they are seeking to be and can uniquely contribute. Most of the time we do programs which are to teach people how to all be alike, right? How to do the right things. Instead, I say it's all a capacity problem. If people are misusing earth or one another, it's really because they don't have the capacity to see the effect is actually coming back on them and to them. If we worked 100% of the time on developing each person's capability to think better, to manage themselves, we'd have a very different world. So that's the first two words, evolve capacity. Put that in front and forget all this other behavior modification stuff. Secondly, what you're helping them do is express their own essence. So the essence of my father was not a horrible person. He ended up without the capability, grew up in a way he never found his essence. Essence is that which makes us who we are, that if everything else was taken away, we couldn't be that. So for example, my, uh, and I always call him candidate because uh, our birth certificate doesn't say any. Carol Sanford was born with his essence. I wish it did, right? You have to discover it. And I do work in this book, The Regenerative Life, is a lot about how you find essence thinking, your own, but also how you engage in the world in a way that we aren't just trying out a bunch of things. We're actually looking at essence. So I use the, the term, my grandfather christened me with this, is my essence is to disrupt certainty. All so right. people get so convinced that they know the right thing, do the right thing, that they have it all, that they can't see something new. They can't get perspective. And that uh, work seems to be binding the world. It makes me unpopular sometimes because I'm very direct and very confronting. But if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be me. Yeah. Your work is with each child and with each person, including Malcolm. Have Malcolm know what his essence is. Know how to bring that into the world. Know what difference it makes. And most people don't know that. I start with any company I work with going back to its founding, which is where essence can easily still be seen, mm. and how you bring that forward into life. And if we have time, I'll give you some examples. The last two, so that was evolve capacity for essence, um, excuse me, essence expression. The last two terms are through system actualization. Now, I don't know whether you're a fan of Abraham Maslow, but he uh, created a little hierarchy. And yep. actually in many cultures, it's in many uh, uh, Hindu par part type things similar to it, Tibetans, uh, indigenous communities. And the top of it was called self-actualizing. Now think about what self-actualizing means is me being all I can be, the potential I can bring in, that's lovely. But I worked with people who taught me about system actualizing, that it wasn't about actualizing me in my life, although that came along with it, but it was about me working to actualize every system. So if we took the taxing services, for example, of all our countries, and we said it's not about extracting uh, taxes, but it's about enabling wealth creation. Mm -hmm. We said the IRS, what we call it in the States, 
is about wealth creation. Would we do taxing a very different way? You bet we would. Mm. And you could say <clears throat> the criminal justice system is really about making sure no one ever goes through that same error more than once. So right. there's the six words, evolved capacity for essence expression through system actualizing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like that. I really, I can follow that very, very well there. But, you know, it often wonders to me why people don't think about their own capability. They almost seem to switch off when they leave school on, le on continuing learning, don't they? <clears throat> Not only do people switch off, but they enter systems which don't first, even know about what I just said. Secondly, don't believe it. And even if they think, yeah, I'd like to help everyone realize their potential and do great things in the world, they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. That's why I write, I speak, I run communities, because the one gift that I was given, and I believe it, um, it's my work to pass on, is how do you do that? How do you build systems that are radically different than the way we build schools and even families and jobs and the military and government, all with, um, I, I think I might call it myths about how the world works. We make things up. So it is, as you say, a, a bit disconcerting that people, well, and it's even before they leave school, but certainly after they, they leave school, they feel like they're cooked right? Mm. We're done. Uh, yeah. And so we're shaking up and working with how you change things is a lot of what my life is mm. about. Yeah. I, and I suppose in the same way of you thinking about looking at taxes in a different way, if we talked about continuing your learning and you say it will keep your brain active so you will live longer, is that yeah. the, the simple thinking? Yeah. And not only will you live longer, that's true, you will have a meaningful life. Yeah. yeah. And so having people, and I, I do believe that individuals can awaken to this, but I believe it has to be in combination with organizations which build a new kind of infrastructure. They, I don't get rid of hierarchies. Like in South Africa, where we uh, moved Black Africans to being leadership at the top when the uh, constitution, the new constitution mandated that mm. we didn't do it by removing people who were white at the top. Instead, we gave everyone new roles, built the capability of the black Africans who had never uh, been allowed to go to a formal school, which may have been a good thing because they would have gotten what you and I got that uh, had limitations Instead, we built their ability to think systemically to run a company, Colgate Palmolive, uh, and to do it in a way that transformed townships and transformed how the governing processes worked in the country. So, yeah, it, it's a bit disconcerting that people don't know what to do, but we have to get this combined thing of helping build capability a different way, but build different kind of infrastructure for people to be able to work in. Mm. Carol, just before we move to part two, let me just remind everyone of your URL, your website URL, which is obviously viewers you can see on the screen behind me, but for listeners, let me read that out. It's Carol, C-A-R-O-L, Sanford, S A N. F-O-R-D, carolsanford.com. And Carol's book, The Regenerative Life, Transform Any Organization, Our Society, and Your Destiny, the one you can see on the screen behind me, is published by Nicholas Brearley. Right, Carol, part two. On one of the many aspects you're thinking, uh, of your thinking, I find of true value, your theory of change. Can you please take us in simple terms through its four elements? I can. And uh, actually, I'm going to do it in a way that's slightly different than in the book, just to make it interesting for you too, Malcolm. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, the, uh, the, the problem is that we actually have four theories of change at work in the world. And I learned about this way of thinking about it. First, I want to tell you by having 
briefly had a chance to study with Thomas Kuhn, who wrote The Structure of the Scientific Revolution, which probably is the most important work about how change works uh, that we still are even aware of today. And he talked about how we, as we went through life, science learned new things and switched how they thought things work. The problem is that we as humans don't tend to let go of the old stuff. So let me tell you what, what I did with Kuhn's work when I studied with him at Berkeley. That was lovely, but he didn't give me a way to use it. So I created a practical instrument uh, about theories of change. The base one that we still operate of, and it comes like out of Sir Isaac Newton, is the uh, billiard ball theory of change which is uh, what I call extract value, which is, so if you think about, if you play billiards or pool, mm -hmm. you, you think of yourself as a cue stick and you see other people that they're the ball and you want to hit them with yourself, the cue stick, and you know, usually in a way that somehow they love you doing this. But the key is you see pockets that you're trying to get them into. So you mm -hmm. go, move them with that cue stick, hit the ball and towards some particular pocket. And I call that the extract value because I'm getting back what I want. Right. That is still very much true in the way most businesses are run. I manipulate you as a consumer with my cue stick called my advertising campaign, right? And I get you into the buy pocket and with all the influencers, which are a part of getting you there, and then you buy and I get what I want. That's to me a very sad mm -hmm. unidirectional theory of change, but it is the predominant one that still drives us. There's a second theory of change which disrupted Newton's billiard ball or actually more added to it, um, which came about with John Watson in behavioral psychology. And what Watson said is, Humans are like rats in mazes. You don't have to hit them. You have to put cheese at the end right. and then they have to figure out how to get there and you reward them when they do that. You recognize them, good little rat. So we have a theory of change, which is predominantly what governments and organizations and schools use, which is behavioral theory. And it believes that humans can't even see themselves. Only external sources can tell you what to do. And you will hear the term continuously everywhere you go of behavioral economics, behavioral psychology. Mm -hmm. All of that's based on you getting better at manipulating people to be like you want them to be. Now, that's the opposite of where we started here, right? On evolved capacity of, for them to be what they want to be. And we'll get to that in a moment. There's a third theory of change, which comes from the people who rejected the idea of we're rats and said, no, 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 we're, we're conscious human beings, as you said earlier. We can, uh, we can see how to do good in the world. And they created, those are called the humanists for the most part. And the humanists felt like there were values and virtues and things we could teach people how to do and then they could be that. Now, I've already been giving you the downside of the other. So I'm going to give you the downside to do good. Just think about who gets to decide what the good is. If you look at what happens with philanthropy, and I wrote an article in The Economist about that, where people are trying to do good, they more often than not have codified their own worldview created an idea of what the good behavior is, the good thinking is, and then they work to impose that on others. This is called being a missionary. It's called uh, also how it is that we colonize people. So when mm -hmm. our, our early ancestors, you and me, Malcolm, left the UK and came to the States and ran into all the indigenous people here, they colonized them. They said, they don't hold the right ideas. We're going to take their children away from them, put them in uh, Western uh, schools. 
uh, make them stop speaking their language, uh, learn the new language. Now, I'm giving the extreme, but we do it in small ways all the time where we conquer a country and we take away everything that they believe in, or we sometimes conquer them with advertising and we take everything we believe. And we believe what was so good for us, it must be good for them. Uh, and philanthropy often, you know, we have the Bill Gates Foundation, the largest foundation in the world right here where I live. And they go into a country and they decide what it is that we should work on, like certain kinds of diseases. We'll do it in a certain way. And it obliterates the culture. So mm -hmm. you can tell so far the first three theories of change I'm not a fan of, right? Where yep. we yep. billiard bar, <laughs> get what we want. We have the behavioral where we treat people like they're rats and we manipulate them. And then the do good where we bring our values and impose them. So obviously I'm not a fan. <laughs> gotcha. The fourth one I call regenerate life. Or sometimes I call it evolved capacity. And it's always based on the idea that each of us with development, with evolving our capacity, building capability, can see what it is we are, quote, meant to be, called to be, uh, want to be. And once we do that, our work, if we're in my theory of change, is supporting people learning to do that. So I have grandchildren. I have other kids I raise. I have hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of executives and leaders I've worked with all over the world. My job is not to teach them what they should be, but to help them discover who it is they're seeking to be, what their essence is, and spend their life getting better and better and better and better at that. And doing it out of their own essence, not a standardized, like the other three, there's mm -hmm. a standardized do good or behavior or pocket to get in. If I can avoid that, and I can get instead and say, Malcolm, let's sit down. Let's talk about who you are. Let's talk about what you're trying to be. What are you trying to do with this TV show? What are you trying to do with your life? And if you're in one of my communities, we work on learning how to do that. And then my job is to give you increased capacity and capability to support where you're going. That's my theory of change. I like that one, and I'm all for it. Carol, part three. As in everything, the strategy is no good without the execution. Can you give, kindly give my viewers and listeners a selection of action points that as today's leaders, they can apply from regenerative life so as to build, as you say, a regenerative business that becomes enduringly non-displaceable in its markets? So first, I'm going to tell you and everybody in the world, to quit asking for simple action points. Yeah. Now, let me tell you why, because what I'm gonna suggest you do has more power. And the main reason why I don't think people should do that is they are operating with a mind that is at one of those other three paradigms by definition. I mean, I have never met a human being that can say, oh yeah, I'm always at that top. I'm always working that way. So what they do is anytime I give them things to do, they hear it through that old paradigm. And then they dumb it down, make it something they already know how to do and nothing new happens. So my first suggestion is stop looking for simple solutions. Instead, start working on your own capability. Now, how in the world do you do that? Work on being able to shift paradigms, as Thomas Kuhn said. And this is far more work than you can imagine because it means literally being willing to shift in every occasion how you see the world. So let me talk about how I did that in this book and how my new book coming out is trying to do it while you read the book. In this book, I said, if we could learn to first, and you could, you could try this one as a little bit of an idea. Instead of when you're getting ready to work with your children, well, let me say for it's the book is about nine roles, meta roles, which if we could step into those, we are likely to see the world differently. So for example, parent, most of us that have been parents, our parents, our grandparents, our foster parents, or any of those roles 
have a tendency to have one way we parent, which is how we were parented. If we were to say, wait a minute, how would, and we put in our mind a meta role, like how would Gandhi parent my children? Why? <laughs> what do you mean? How would Gandhi? Well, Gandhi had children, but the idea really is to switch. So it's not you through your eyes, but through someone else. Now there've been books written about this. How would Aristotle do this? How would Jesus do this? How would, um, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, any mm. number of people, people can, but mind what you're doing is breaking an attachment to how you normally see something. So I took nine roles and said, how is it that if you were in a different role? And I said, the essence of parenting, what it's really about, how would you go about engaging in that role? So we, I had this was by the way an action research project. I had almost 150 people involved. We have 60 something of their stories in the book about how it transformed everything from parenting to being a designer to an educator to a media content creator to an economist to a citizen entrepreneur, etc. When we talked about parenting, we said <clears throat> the work of parenting is to help each child become self-determining about the effects of their actions. Mm -hmm. What would it be like if each of us, before we acted, thought about, and I'm not talking about taking a long time. You, you can just quickly think about, if I say this this way, this is going to have this effect on this person. Not to manipulate them, but to help them, to, and not from do good, but from where they're trying to go. How is that I help them be self-determining? Well, I would change instead of telling them what to do. Here's, here's young man, what you've got to do. I would say, what is it you think you're trying to achieve with what you're about to do? I'd be a resource to them. Now, how are you going to do that? Not having them think about their own answers. Now you've done it. What do you think? How did that work? Ah, well, you got another idea for next time? Okay, we're going to try that. Then I watch them try that and I say, how did that go based on how you thought it would go? What I'm doing is helping them become self-directing, self-managing, self-determining about the effects they have in the world rather than it's the parent who says, well, you always say yes, sir, and no, sir. You always do uh, the following kind of procedure because that's what good, you know, fill in the blank uh, children do. If I thought about that, the essence of parenting is enabling children to become adults who are self-determining about the effects of the world, boy, would we have a different world. Mm -hmm. I, I did that with nine roles. Well, we did it as a result of the action research project. And out of it, like, for example, uh, I have the, one of my forwards is written by a TV host here in the States, a TV and radio host on National Public Radio, uh, where she's the uh, host of Here and Now, which is one of our biggest shows here. And uh, Tanya was able to uh, rise in the world because she pays so much attention to what the essence of being a media content creator is. And what we ended up articulating that is it's helping people discover their own truth and discover how it is we can give hope. Because if you think about the news, it mostly makes us lose hope. Mm. Well, how do you do it in a way people can discover their own truth? Not you come on and tell them the truth. And Tanya says this has changed completely how she interviews guests, how she engages with her own children. Uh, each of these nine roles, you can break loose, break your certainty about how they should be done if you understand how the essence of that role would work, like how mm. Gandhi would do it. Uh, and it's a much more exciting way to live. And believe it or not, all but parent exists in the company. So yeah. there are citizens there, media, designers, entrepreneurs, uh, spirit resources. So 
we have people learn about these roles in a company and then they don't fall into their old patterns, the old paradigm. They're mm -hmm. able to, in situations, whether it's with a customer, whether it's with a supplier, uh, an employee, they're always being able to lift it up and say, what's the essence of this conversation? How do I go there? Not my mechanical automatic way. Mm. Hopefully that gives people. Yeah, I, I really like that. And, and whilst we've been uh, talking in this interview, two of my grandchildren have arrived at the studio. So I'm going to try that afterwards when we've finished. <laughs> I said at the... Yeah, I said at the beginning to strap yourself in for a stimulating and inspirational interview. Now, don't worry if you didn't get it all at that instant light bulb moment. I, I didn't personally myself, but now I do. And it's exciting. You can replay this interview as many times as you like and also encourage your colleagues to do so. Then why not have a regenerative life blue sky session between you? The outcome and impact is worth it especially for conscious leaders. Thank you, Carol Sanford, author of The Regenerative Life, Transform Any Organization, Our Society, and Your Destiny. Thank you very much indeed, Carol. You're very welcome. And I invite people to explore my book clubs and do what you talked about at their website. Thank you so much for having me, Malcolm.